So please welcome to the stage our very special guest, Theron Nephew Feemster. <laughs> What's up? How you doing? Everybody say, ah, ah, ah. ah. I love it, I love it. Um, this is, thank y'all for coming. Um, this is really great to be here. This is our first master class. I've never um, done a master class. Tonight, um, I'm going to show y'all a glimpse of my imagination and, and how I process things. And I want y'all to understand me. I want to tell you who I am and where I'm from. Is that OK with you? Well, I'm from a galaxy far, far, far away. Yeah. Um, I grew up in North Carolina. I uh, started playing when I was two years old. I grew up playing in church. Uh, and church was a very special, nurturing place for me to grow up. It, was, it wasn't a religious church. It was more of they allowed me to be free in how I wanted to express my musical self. I want to play music in the way that where people feel something. It don't matter if it's one note. It don't matter if it's two notes or a bunch of chords. The key is always to help them time travel. Your music should be so honest that people can always find their way back there, even 20 or 30 years later. And that's what real feelings and being honest with your music could do. So that happened. And so it was time to go to college. So I heard about this college named Berkeley, and, and I heard that you only had to take one education class to get a degree, and I thought that was like the best college ever, and it was all music classes. And so I went to college, I auditioned, and they gave me the scholarship. And when I went there, I went inside this musical universe, because where I'm from, culturally-wise, is very limited. And but when I went to Boston, I saw people from every culture, you know, and, and where there's culture, there's music, and there's different kinds of music, there's different feelings of music. So I met all of these beautiful players from around the world. And I really didn't learn much from my classroom. It was more, I've learned more from the musicians that was there from around the world, and just hearing their interpretation and their styles. And, and they tried to teach me songwriting even at Berkeley, but it was so confusing to me. I was in my room and this guy walked in and he said, yo, what do you want to do for the next five years of your life? And I really went to Berkeley to be a film composer, but when I walked into the, the computer labs, it was so intimidating because I didn't have a computer. And I was like, man, that's scoring music? It's like, man, that's those the labs and the buttons and the numbers. So I kind of just, drifted off and just started really hanging out with friends because I really wasn't learning anything from classes. And, um, and he said, what do you like doing? I was like, I like, you know, making beats on my keyboard. And he was like, you know, people have careers off of that. They call it producing. I was like, they do? Because I thought at the time the biggest thing you could be in music was maybe playing behind uh, Kurt Franklin or, you know, a gospel artist on DC Talk. Oh, y'all know about that. Uh, I thought that's the biggest thing you could be in music. I, I had no clue, you know, people had careers. And he was like, yeah. I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be a producer. So I called my parents, and I told them that I was ready to leave school. My parents were like, you know what? You, you hold, hold on to that thought. We're going to call you next week. And if you really feel like that next week, we're going to fly out and see you. So next week came. I felt the same way my parents flew to Boston. They looked me in my eyes, and they could tell I was serious. They gave me their blessings, so I went home to North Carolina, and I got a phone call from this guy, Eric. Eric was already out here in L.A. I think he was at Jodeci at the time. Jodeci, yeah, he's was touring Jodeci. And he was like, hey, man, I got a job out here in L.A. if you, if you want to come. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, um, I got a situation with Atlantic Records in L.A. See, L.A. was foreign to me. You know, the only thing I knew about L.A. was Moesha and 90210, <laughs> you know. From North Carolina to L.A., that's like Neverland. You know, you never think about it, you never hear about it, you know, it's just never an option. 
<laughs> you know? And so, next thing you know, I told my parents that, you know, I put them on a phone call with Eric on speakerphone. He was like, yeah, you know, we come out here, have a place to stay, and, you know, let them try it out. So my parents gave me $500, a suitcase, and an amp. That was over 20 years ago. That $500 stretched me that many years. <laughs> so um, I got another phone call. They said, hey, Sunshine is putting her band together. And, and you should go play keys. So I remember going to center staging down here in Burbank. Amazing. Give you a timestamp. This is when uh, Cisco had the thong song was out. You know, really? I know, right? So I remember going to center staging. It was amazing, right? And I walked in there. Macy Gray was there with her big glasses. And she said, hey, hey, Ron. They called me Ron then. Ron, you know, the musical director didn't show up. You, you want to be the musical director? <laughs> I was like, yeah, right? You know, because I was traveling doing those Tyler Perry gospel plays at like 14 around the country. So, you know, and I was, and I was a music director for my church. And um, so I said, yeah. She was like, if you can make this band sound good, you got the job. So, yeah, man, we toured the, we toured the world. We toured all Europe and, and the U.S. And, and I, I'm getting to a place, right? And for me, that was feeding my inspiration, like the unknown, the excitement, the, the beauty of walking in your purpose. You're not trying to make money. You're, you're loving your gift. And I never remember trying to make money. I just remember I love my gift so much. And that just created these awesome doors you know, for me, I was in the right place at the right time. Anyway, they had a meeting with this guy. They said, hey, we got a meeting out, you know, in L.A. with Dr. Dre. You mind if we play on your music? Mind you, I really didn't know who Dr. Dre was, so I really didn't care. I was like, yeah, this is whatever. So um, they came out here, and they had some tracks that I made in my dorm room that I gave them, you know. And they played it for Dre, and Dre wanted to know who I was. So Dre sent people out to find me in. So I remember going to meet Dre at his studio. Dre was like, hey, so play something. And I was like, oh, OK. But it wasn't just play. He said, make me a beat. And the only way I could make beats at the time was the Triton. So Dre said, make me something like for Whitney Houston. So I made him a, a, a Whitney Houston type of, you know. <laughs> He's like, all right, okay, make me, you know, make me something dark. You know, he always wanted to be like dark, and I didn't understand what gangsta dark was. Like, <laughs> I grew up in church, you know what I mean? I grew up with the light, you know, and uh, and and Dr. Dre, this is fun facts. What's really hard is when you take a, mu a musician and teach a musician on how to make records. It's hard. Because sometimes musicians overplay or they overdo it. But Dr. Dre was my mentor, and he introduced me to George Clinton. So I went from church to funk. It's the same chops, just different interpretation. So he would play me George Clinton. And I was like, what is this? Because growing up, my parents didn't allow me to listen to no secular music. But I loved music. I want you to understand, like, it was not always pretty. And heart can take you places that your talent can't. Heart to take you past rejection. Heart to take you past places where it may seem hard. Or I'm not going to get through this. or I don't know how I'm going to make it. And I, I had a few of those situations, but I always had my music. And I always had my imagination. And wherever I could find a keyboard, a piano, organ, I can always find my freedom. Dr. Dre immediately flew me up to Nevada, where we, we started to work on the Eminem show record. So I remember being at the studio, and Dr. Dre was there, and Eminem was, Dr. Dre was here, and Eminem was right here. And that was crazy. And, you know, and um, 
and I was nervous. Believe it or not, I was actually nervous. And and Dre said, hey, they, you know, they were just looking at me. And I looked back at them, you know, and and I, I'm and tonight I didn't want to premeditate anything. I didn't want to set up sounds. I kind of wanted to be raw and organic. I want I want y'all to feel the energy that I feel, the energy of the unknown. How are you gonna do it? How are you gonna connect the dots? How are you gonna make it work? Because this is this is the truth. If you don't play. Somebody else will. As soon as he said that, I did this. And that was the start of Men Dre's career. And all of those big string sounds you hear, that's where it started. And that's when Eminem was like, let's get down to business. Ah, no, 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 no. So, and once you end, it just all fell. Man, and then Dr. Dre, from then on, we did the 50 Cent Records together. You know, I remember that moment when he was like, uh, play me some gangster chords. <laughs> One day I'm gonna tell Dre the truth about this song. So I was like, gangster chords? It's like, when you in church, what do church gangster chords sound like? <laughs> and I did this. And 50 was like, if I can't do it, homie. And so that's how that was born. So I had to pull from <laughs> emotional places that made me feel gangster. And it was in the church, you know, you know. And, uh, and Dre was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, you know, I was the least non gangster person. Uh, uh. And um, so time went on, we did some really great records. We did some Super Bowl stuff together. And today, Dre is still my mentor, my big brother. And then, so it came to a time for me and, you know, me and Dre, it was time to, I went my own way and, and Dre kind of took a break too. And Beats was later, was later born, right? Can you only imagine? Um, that's when I got a phone call, um, Neo. Um, but before that, the way I got to New York, I remember during that time, I went up to New York to meet Jay-Z. And um, it was Jay-Z, Dame Dash, and Biggs at the time, and Kanye, Kanye West, and uh, and, and my Just Blaze. We was at Baseline Studios. Remind you, I'm from Grover, North Carolina. I had no style. I mean, you, my, I ain't saying North Carolina had style, but can you imagine me? I'm walking in Baselines with some, like, uh, North Carolina Tar Heel blue neon shorts and my shirt tucked in my shorts. <laughs> like happy, you know, walking in. And uh, I remember walking in the studio and Guru was there by the board. And, uh, and but when I put my fingers on the keys, it all disappeared. How I looked, the stereotype of what I would be what people really want from you is what's inside. So I, I tell these stories to kind of help anyone. Don't let your outer appearance affect your real appearance. Because what people really want, they really want your heart. And at the end of the day, if you're always honest, like that's going to transform your music in like the most magical ways. And so I remember Jay-Z. You know, we started, we, you know, working on the Blueprint record, the Gift and the Curse record. And I started playing, and I saw Jay-Z just in the corner. And he heard the beat one time. And he said, Goo, I'm ready. And he went into the booth. And one time, he did the whole song, and that was it. I'd never seen anything like that. And so... I was walking down the hallway and Jay-Z and Dame Dash, they looked at me and was like, hey bro, you can't be out in New York looking like that with us. You know, <laughs> you just can't be, we can't do that. Real, real talk. And so next thing you know, I was at the Regal Royal Hotel in New York and they sent me boxes of Rockerware, extra, extra large. And so I, 
So I'm walking to New York with all these big clothes and identity crisis, right? Dang. Uh, then I got another phone call. And I was at track record. And uh, I was like, hello? Uh, he's like, hi. I was like, who's this? This is Michael Jackson. I was like, hey. He's like, hey. He's like, I love this stuff you do with Dr. Dre and all this stuff. I want to meet you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> all right. You know. So he sends me a limousine and he sends me to Neverland. So I go to Neverland. He takes my phone. He had no phones. You can't take pictures. pictures. Bro, it was like growing, going into like Disneyland. Like, you know, Lamborghini golf carts, you know, train station, Ferris wheels. You know, cookies on fake mannequins that were hot and warm. <laughs> Everybody had to smile at you when they seen you, his whole staff. If I wanted crab legs at 3 in the morning, they had to make it. You know, it was the craziest stuff, right? And um, so me and Michael's relationship, we started there. And then we would travel all over the world. But there's a reason why Michael Jackson is Michael around the world, musically. Michael said, melody is king over everything. I was like, oh. And before I was a beat maker, you know, you know, when I was getting these Mario placements and Neo placements and 50 cents plays, I was just, when I look back at my career, I wasn't a producer yet. Even though I got producer credit and you just make a beat, you send it to the artist, they rap on it or they sing on it and you get paid and you get producer. I thought that was producing, but there's levels to it. And one thing about producers, which I want to be a blessing to producers, I want to help to develop, fully develop people into what it is to be a full producer. And um, Michael was intent, but we would walk into a room and we would talk like this first and we would talk about life and say something was happening across the world and, and he really felt it and, and he would start crying. So I was like, oh. So he has this little tape recorder with him and as he start crying, as he's crying, right, I, I pull out my laptop, I just start playing while he's crying. He's talking, people are hurting, you know, we got to make this world a better place. I wish I wrote that song. Uh, <laughs> right here. He'll start talking and I start playing, I, just, I start scoring him like church. I play like that when he cried because you have to be able to be sensitive to the moment. You got to score the moment and let it be about the music and not about how good you are. Because you could lose the moment and and you're scoring people's emotions and you're scoring their hearts. And if you can master that, learn, knowing how to pull people in with your music and choosing the right timbre of sounds. And so we would like search the earth for sounds the world has never heard before. So his theory is if we can get three alien sounds the world has never heard before, a melody, and the lyric that everybody can feel, he's like, you will rock the world. We could work on the song for two years. Can you imagine the torture? Two years working on the song. And after I'm thinking the song is like ready, we did the key changes, Michael coming in the room, he'd be like, yes, yes. It's like, do you think it could be better? <laughs> <laughs> I took a break from music. I'm just skipping out all of the crazy parts. and. Uh, then I decided to come back to music. Um, this is when my after Michael died. And I had to decide what did I really want to do. And I wanted to be honest. And I got, oh, and I forgot I got a record deal and all of that stuff in between all of that. Got a $3 million record deal. How you go from $500 to $3 million record deal, right? I thought it was a joke. You know, they flew me up to New York and they asked me, you know, do I want to be an artist? And I thought it was a joke. I don't sing, you know, then, right? 
And uh, they was like, yeah, we want to sign you, give it this deal. And, and, and when the paperwork came, I was like, oh, this is real. Like, I really have to figure this out. So I remember going into Glenwood Studios and I remember getting behind the booth and trying to rap. It was terrible. I remember trying to figure out how to sing. I was scared of myself because I was so used to being the beat maker. Being the, but to produce yourself, to find yourself, I was like, this is what an artist feels like. And I remember them giving me a song and telling me to sing it. And it was the most hardest thing. It's like I couldn't feel the lyrics and I couldn't feel the melody. And I was like, wow. So this is what it feels like on the other side of the booth. And so I remember I didn't know what to do and I just started going out with my friends, going to the beach. And, and I remember as I was going to the beach, I started having fun and all of these melodies start coming to my head. And, and I would make music in the studio and I would be the one jumping on speakers, going crazy. You know, people thought I was on drugs. You know, but I was just me, just crazy. You know? Just jumping on speakers, happy, and it hit me. If the music makes you feel like that, then that's the music for you. I was like, oh, I got it. That moment taught me how to be a better producer. What it is to produce an artist, what it is to fill them, what it is to score them, do something that helps them be the best version of themselves. You know, knowing it is to produce a great vocal or be a great arranger, or knowing it is when the hook is too long or when the verse is too long, or knowing when the tempo of a song is too slow, or, and knowing what a good melody is. The job of a real producer is to make sure at the end of the day you come up with a really, really great song. A complete producer understands that. Is the hook easy? Is it too many words in the hook? Is the verse, is it too many lyrics? Is it easy to follow? Can, I, can you tell me your story in three minutes with an intelligent melody? And, and that was just on the songwriting side and then you had to score it. And now we have so many different styles of music and, it's like, and now we have Spotify and streams. It's like, oh, so much music. How do you win? How do you get your music out there? How do you compete when there's millions of people that got their music online? The first trick is to focus first on you. Figure out how to be the best version of you. And people ask me all the time, what is that new sound? What is that new thing? And my answer is the same. It's freedom, it's, it's be yourself. There's nobody like you in this entire room. How about this, this entire planet? If you can master you, just like you only have your fingerprint, only you have your sound. And once a person accepts their freedom, accepts their insecurity, accepts the fact that they don't know all the answers, who does? When you can go in a studio with no ego, you can go in the studio and you, and you can scream at the top of your lungs without nobody caring. And you can just be your ultimate self without apologizing or dimming your light. That is when you're going to find the real magic. And that's one of the hardest things to do. People talk about credibility and, you know, credits, 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 credits. No, the biggest credit is yourself. I'm looking for people who are willing to be free people who are willing to to like hear and flow and and challenge themselves it's, all, it's always about the song never about our ego because our ego could ruin the song and a hit song to me is a melody in the conversation that the whole world wants to hear simple right right I'm going to give you all another very wise, wise statement. Believe it or not, for the ones at the top, it's not a competition. It's more of what's my assignment. And if you focus on your assignment and they focus on their assignment, 
and they focus on their assignment, you get all of these beautiful colors of the music business. But we have to be okay with being ourselves and not competing with one another. It's okay to have to be inspired to might do something and to motivate you. But remember, it's your assignment, figuring out what is my journey, what is my assignment, and what's my sound. Heart can take you places that your talent can't. And um, but I want to give you the tools. I want to give you the, your own fishing rods. There's no such thing as writer's block. No such thing. Anytime you feel like you get in that stereotype of, oh, I can't think or I can't hear anything, go live your life. Go to the beach. Go hug somebody. Go play a video game. Go eat your favorite food. Like, our music is only our outlet, our life is so much bigger. But if y'all walk away from this master class, just get one thing. Like, be free. Like, don't hold back. You know, these secret melodies and these witty inventions, they're like floating up in the heavens, just waiting for somebody that's willing to pull it down there. And um, so what I'm going to do now, I don't know what I'm about to do. I'm just going to put my hands to the keys. And um, y'all might, as I do this, I'm going to invite some friends up. And I'm just going to play and score this room. Just how, like, y'all make me feel a certain kind of way. Are y'all getting something? Yeah. yeah.